So if we're going to talk about prayer, we should pray. And if you are capable of doing it, I'd like you to get on your knees. If um, it's hard to get on your knees, just bow your head right where you're at. But if physically you're able to, I'd like to encourage you to, to get on your knees. God, around the world, um, there is still tragedy and violence and anger and hatred. And, and this week again, some more people were killed, Christians, simply because they, they are followers of you. The body of Christ around the world, in many places, is under severe persecution. And we pray for their peace right now. Some were unable to worship today because of the persecution, because there are those in their community who have burned their buildings or have stood out and locked them out of them and, and then are, are hostile and angry and mean and hateful. And Lord, we pray for your body that continues to be wounded, injured, uh, even killed. We pray that you would give peace to the body of Christ. And that, Lord, none of this would stop us from continuing to love even our enemies. Help us, Lord. Even in this nation, there is so much anger, meanness. Lord, help us to show love. As we are coming close to Easter, Jesus, oh, I pray that first that the reality of your resurrection would inspire us, would again make us new, would cause us to, to be even more excited about what you've done for us. And then I pray, Lord, that that would move us to take your love into this community. Lord, there are many here in, in our area, in our town, that, that even say that they believe in you, but they are distant from you. God, help us to encourage them to come closer. There are those in, in our community that, that fight and battle with their addictions and the shame and the guilt and the control of those addictions Try to keep them from you and your peace. Help us, Lord, to speak truth to them. And again, through love, to show them that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Lord, it's not our responsibility to show judgment. That one day will be your responsibility. But in the meantime... You've called us to share grace, love, kindness, forgiveness. Help us to do that. So I pray for our town. I pray for the body of Christ on this mountain. That we will be very faithful to you, especially during this season. And well, I pray for that all the time, Lord. But, but it's especially at this time when the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ will We'll meet some with doubt, with frustration, perhaps even open hostility. But help us to recognize divine appointments, God. Opportunities just to show your love to somebody else. So God, we pray for revival. We pray that revival would begin in each one of us. Forgive us, Lord, when we look at someone else and think they should change. Instead, Lord, help us to look inside and see where you want to change us. And then, Lord, I, I pray for these next few moments as we share together from your word. Help me not to be in the way, Jesus. 
Holy Spirit, speak even in spite of my inadequacies, Holy Spirit. God, help us to listen and then to respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I was tempted to call Debbie with my cell phone and I was going to put her on video and let you see because what's interesting is we have the abilities now with our cell phones to actually see somebody we're talking to. Isn't that cool? I mean, you actually can see them. We can, we can call to Florida, which hopefully we'll get to do this afternoon. And when we call, hopefully we'll get to talk to Theo, who's talking now in full, complete sentences and Tenley, who's starting her own kind of words and stuff like that. And hopefully we'll get to see them, which makes it even more special. It just makes it kind of more real rather than just hearing the voices. Uh, the other day, uh, the, in fact, this morning we got a text from, uh, from Philip, and it was a picture of uh, Theo, and it, was, um, uh, and, and it started off, the, the, Theo's talking on his uh, little pretend phone, I guess it was. Um, Hi, Brody. How are you? Brody's, Brody's their dog that we're taking care of. Uh, hi, Marley. That's their other dog we're taking care of. Uh, how are you? Uh, hi, Papa. How are you? No, no, before that was Uncle Tim. Hi, Uncle Tim. How are you? Uh, hi, Papa. How are you? And last but not least, the most special one of all, Hi, Grammy. How are you? <laughs> and, and, there's, and he's got pictures of him as he's, as he's making these statements and all. But what's really better is to be able to see them. Now, even better than that is what? Not just to see them by video, but to see them face to face right there with you. Now, here's why am I pointing all this out. Because God is in all those different kinds of dimensions. There is more to God than we probably comprehend. There are more dimensions to God than, we, than, than clearly we understand. Today, we're going to be talking about praying in five dimensions. Now, God is multidimensional. We can see it in creation. God was present in creation and when he was there in creation. Did you see the different aspects of God? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God spoke and there was light. And what did, you, what did I just describe for you? Three different dimensions of God at work. God the Father who is creating, God the Spirit, the power over the waters, and what? Jesus Christ, the living Word of God. John 1 helps you understand it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Think about that. How does, the, how does a Word become flesh? God is a multidimensional God. There's different aspects to God. So today we're going to be looking at Job as kind of a, a guide for us a little bit. And I thought it'd be interesting just for you to, to know, before I go into the actual verses, Job 11, 5 and 6 says, Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom, for true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. And the man who's speaking there to Job, he says, I just, I just wish that God would speak for you, Job. I wish that you'd be able to hear him. I wish that you'd be able to get his wisdom, his counsel. And by the way, just so you know, Job, even if you don't get it, and, and remember, these are the friends that are really loving him, right? <laughs> these were pretty good friends. They started off seven days saying nothing. But they ran out of gas at the end of that seven days, and then they started to talk. And they started to point out all the things, the ways that, that Job was sinning. Because they were confident of the fact that if all this bad stuff was happening to him, it was because of his sin. But look, he even says, and look, God has even forgotten some of your sins, Job. That's a good thing. But, but the, isn't this our desire? Oh, how I wish that God would speak. You ever prayed that? Oh, God, speak to me. There is one prayer I have for every Sunday morning is, Oh God, speak through me. Speak in a way that we can all hear. Oh God, I want to hear you speak. 
Well, I want you to back up, or actually move forward a couple more verses. Job 11, verses 7 and 9 says, Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? Their measure is no longer than the earth. Excuse me, their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. What was Tyler just describing? <laughs> that God can count those numbers, even infinity. And yet he's outside of that as well, isn't he? But yet then, but he's also inside of that. And so there's some of the different dimensions of God. God is a multi-dimensional God. How do we see that? Well, one of the ways we see that is in God's creation. In Romans 1.20, Paul says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Have you ever heard, heard somebody say, you know, how's the, that, that person in Africa who's never heard about God, how's, how are they going to know anything about God? And how's God going to judge them for what they know? What does Romans say? That person in Africa who has never met a Christian, there aren't very many of those. Who's never heard the gospel? There's very few of those. But if there was somebody, what does God say? God says, I've been showing you from the beginning of your life through all that surrounds you, through all of nature, from the sun going up to the moon going down, the, there's order in life that I created. This didn't just happen. This wasn't by chance. By the way, if, if you're a, a pure evolutionist, I got to tell you, that takes tons more faith than a person to believe, believe in creation. It, it does. Because you look around, and if, for example, this plate here, can you imagine that that plate just all of a sudden existed? That the things all came together and suddenly here's a plate. Oh, and it's got this little soft thing inside of it so that you, we can't hear your money when it drops in there. Your, 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 your coins, right? <laughs> How do you know that somebody made this? Think about it. How do you know that somebody... Think about it. How do you know that somebody made this? Because you look at it and you say, okay, there's obvious design. There's obvious order. And we all know things don't just kind of like, whoop. In fact, that, how many millions of years would it take for everything to come together to form this? Now, how many millions of years would it take for everything to come together, all the cells, all, the, all of what formed the first human being? It takes an incredible amount of faith to believe we oozed. Because when we look at something like this, we say somebody designed that. Somebody had a hand in its creation. Look around the room. Somebody designed you, had a hand in your creation. And, and that's the beauty of it is, is there's a dimension of God that was there back in creation. We also see that God's multidimensional in, in Jesus' incarnation. But what an incredible thing. And the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us full of grace and truth. And we've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, through God, God becomes flesh. God's living Word comes alive and walks there and, and we can touch Him and we can see Him and hear Him and, and feel Him and He does incredible kinds of things because God is alive right there in His Word. The Word becomes flesh. That is, isn't that incredible? I mean, how many of us have had our words you know, come back and haunt us? Aha. So your words have been alive too then, haven't they? <laughs> If, if your words come back and haunt you, okay, so they come to, come to life in a way, didn't they? That's if, if you say, I love you, isn't that part of it? Don't you want those words to come alive? The, the Word, the living Word of God, through which all things were created. Look back at Genesis. God spoke, and there was night and day. God spoke, 
and there was animal life. God spoke and the waters were separated from the deep. God spoke and there was the moon and the stars and, and the sun and, and God spoke and, and there were all, all fish and, and all of that that goes in the waters and, and finally God speaks and what does He do? He forms humanity. It's by the power of God's spoken word that He created and that word comes alive in Jesus Christ. It's through the incarnation we see He's multidimensional. And we can see it in how the Holy Spirit moves. John 3, 8 says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. Uh, by the way, where does the wind start? It's kind of hard to find, isn't it? <laughs> the, how, how do you track where the wind start and, and then where did it stop, right? It kind of blows here and they know... There, there is no limiting. There is no control. In the same way, the wind blows wherever it pleases. This is John 3, 8. You hear its sound, but you cannot, where it, you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. We don't control the Holy Spirit, do we? And the Holy Spirit is moving in a powerful and a mighty kind of way and, and hopefully moving inside of us and, and accomplishing the Spirit's purposes. But can we see the Holy Spirit? Generally not. Now we may see evidence of the Spirit in a person's life or even some spiritual realm stuff that some who have the gift of discernment actually discern some spiritual things. But the fact is we don't usually see the Spirit, do we? And yet the Spirit's at work in us, moving all part of this God who is multidimensional. So let's try to understand a little bit more about that. Because God's multidimensional, multi you're never alone. Now that could trouble you <laughs> if you're doing something you don't want God seeing. Because God sees. Because you're never alone. He's promised to be with you at all times. And, and maybe sometimes we need to be a little troubled by that fact. Maybe that would help us a little bit if, if when we're tempted and we're about to give in to sin, we said, um, oh, God is here. <laughs> God is watching. God does see. Uh, Lord, maybe I shouldn't take this action. And he's saying, you're right. <laughs> God's multidimensional. He, and, and because I just, I'm, you're never alone. Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you where can I go to get away from God we have a camera down in the coffee shop uh, it's broken right now so if you want to break in we won't be able to see so now would be the opportunity okay um, uh -oh. that camera is pointed towards the cash register and the front door uh, we're more concerned about who might walk in there and then what they might do with the cash and stuff like that, who might come in the front door, because that's basically how somebody would probably break in. But we can actually see the side door too, all from this single camera. That camera, I can see in the middle of the night when it's totally dark and black and there's no lights on inside or outside. That camera still, somehow, I, I, I describe it as it lights up the room. It doesn't do that. It's just got the kind of lens on it that can totally see what's going on in the room. God's better than that. The Spirit of God is able to see, and, and, and that's what the psalmist is saying here. The Spirit of God is able to see and look beyond the dark. And we're not alone. And He sees what we're facing. Do I need to change it? What should I do? Pl plug it in tighter again? That it's meant to keep some of you awake, so. I think I'm turning it the wrong way.
that any better? What? <laughs> okay. Just tap your neighbor and say, are you awake? Okay. Just, just. <laughs> what does it mean to be praying in five dimensions? Um, uh, there's some things I want you, and if you've got uh, paper, I'd encourage you to make some notes and all. What does it mean to pray in five dimensions? The first dimension is I look backwards to the cross. We're going to give you five different ways that, that, that you're, you might want to be praying. This may be the way you want to begin your prayers. Look back to the cross. Uh, we just said how, how deep the love of God, that, that the thought God the Father has for us. Begin your prayers. Begin cross, 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 begin cross, cross. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on that cross for me. Look back to the cross and see what Jesus did. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defeat. When you start to pray this week, Begin your prayers at least this week with thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me on the cross. Thank you for dying on that cross when I didn't deserve it. Thank you for paying the price of my forgiveness. There's nothing I can do to earn that from you. There's no way I can demand that of you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Begin your prayers with a prayer of thanksgiving for what Jesus did on the cross. That's a the first dimension you're looking back to the cross over 2,000 years ago we're looking right and, but the meaning of that the truth of that and here's the incredible thing when he died on that cross who did he die for he died for you he died for you and what's amazing is I don't know how he did it but hanging there on that cross he knew us he knew us he knew us by name he knew the details of us because, because he's God. See, he's there at the beginning. Of the, he, he is now and he's there in the future. And so the first dimension is let's look back and be thankful for what Jesus did in the past. The second dimension is look, look upward into your father's face. And <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you to show of hands, but, but here's the fact I know that many in this room have probably had an issue with your earthly dad. There is a father hunger that all of us have. Sometimes that's been met in a good way by an earthly dad. And sometimes our earthly dads had not known how to do it. They hadn't received it and they didn't give it to us. And some of us still maybe struggle because of that weakness in that relationship with our earthly dad. But our heavenly father and we and here's the thing this week. I really want to challenge you to pray to father God. Even if you've had a bad relationship with your human father. Because your heavenly father is different than your human father. He loves you unconditionally. He loves to have you come and talk with him. He cares so much about you that he gave up his own son on a cross. So let's look into the loving face of our father and by the way how did jesus say it in in his message on prayer luke 11 1 to 2 one day jesus was praying in a certain place and i want you to notice that it's while jesus is praying that his disciples are standing there watching and they're seeing this experience that he's having and he's talking with his father like like a little child would talk with their daddy. And, 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 and the word that he uses is Abba. In fact, he's going to even say to us, look, the disciple, when finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But back up. What did he say first? 
He says, when you pray, pray like this. Father. And the word that is used there is Abba. And it's the word that, that we might translate as Papa. That's the name Theo gave me. I, I get to be Papa. Papa. It's, it's, it relates to the word we would use for Daddy. It, and notice, it's the young child's word. It's not Father, right? It's not even Dad, but it's Daddy. And Jesus is saying, look, when you begin your prayers, look into the loving face of God, your Heavenly Father, who is your Daddy, who is your Papa. He's your Abba. He cares so much about you. Come to Him in prayer. It's that second dimension. We, we look into the face of Dad, our Father. I have a pastor friend here in town who well, oftentimes that's the way he prays. And, and, and I don't know about you, but when you hear a grown man saying, Daddy, thank you, it sounds a little bit odd, doesn't it? And yet, what Jesus is saying is that very phrase. He, he prayed that way just before he goes to the cross. Daddy, Daddy, this is, he's 33 years old. He's, he's mature in all ways. And he says, Daddy, Daddy, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But if this is the only way we can do it, Daddy, then I want to do your will. And so Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father, Daddy, Abba, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Daddy, we want your will in this place in our lives. See, God wants your prayers to be personal. It's Abba, Daddy. Romans 8 says it this way, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought you adoption to sonship. And notice, and by him we cry what? Abba, Father, Daddy. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. You see, I'm no longer, what's that song say? I'm no longer a child of fear. I am a child of God. Rick Warren said, I, I want you to start every prayer with daddy papa or father every prayer why because that's how god says he wants to be addressed you need to change the way you talk to god jesus did not come to earth for you to not use the term he told us to use when you pray say daddy our father papa Abba. How might that influence your praying if you prayed that way? Well, let's find out. This week, begin each prayer with thanksgiving and by calling God Abba, Daddy, Father, Papa. Use one of them, whichever one. If, if, if you're a person who can't use Daddy, then, then use Abba. <laughs> if that's weird, then, then use Dad. But, but talk to God as our Heavenly Father as He desires to be talked to. Not only does God want my prayers to be personal, but God also wants my prayers to be passionate. <laughs> God wants us to mean what we say when we're conversing with Him. God wants a little bit of excitement, a, a, a little bit of passion in our conversation. Now, Hi, God. How are you doing today? Thank you. Uh, rub, 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 thanks for the grub. Yay, God. God bless. Right? <laughs> or, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord myself to keep five. Should I have four awake? Pray the Lord myself to take. Bye, God. Uh, God wants so much more than that. He wants some reality in your prayer. He wants some passion in your prayer. He wants some feeling in your prayer. In fact, in Luke 18, it says this, And will not God bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out 
to him day and night will he keep putting them off oh, by the way that's the story where the woman's uh, bugging the judge <laughs> pestering and and what's jesus saying god's not that way you cry out she's god's listening and we need to have some of that and be more faithful with the, the crying out sometimes <laughs> we need, somebody said we need to put a little oomph into it for god You think about that if you're really in pain really in need god i'm crying out god i need you daddy please help me father i'm in i'm really challenged right now i'm stressed out i'm afraid i'm worried i'm i'm depressed i'm discouraged and and that's the time to to cry out to god and he's wanting us to do that because god wants us to be passionate in our prayer not only does he want us to be passionate and loving and looking in the loving face of God, but God wants us to be in a partnership with him. Folks, don't forget that prayer is a conversation, not a one way. Give me this, give me this by God. Right? It's one of the biggest mistakes, mistakes we can make in prayer is thinking that prayer is all about me coming and telling God what he should already know. Right? God, I want you to do this because I'm smarter than you. God, I've got a plan and I want you to join me in it. God, I've got these things I want you to do and want you to take care of. And he's saying, wait a second, I thought we were going to do this together. You see, God's in a partnership, wants to be in a partnership with us. And he wants to do that in our prayers as well. The Holy Spirit, there's third mention. The Holy Spirit wants to join us and partner with us as we're praying. Look what Romans says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Do we? <laughs> Some of us are praying for things and God's saying, okay, I'm listening, but there's more I want for you. And we don't really know how we maybe should be praying. And he says, we don't know how we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And there are some times that just words won't say what you're feeling. Ever been frustrated like that? You, you've got this emotion going on inside. You can't even explain it. And, and it's kind of like all you can do is like, ah, or cry. Or, and it's the Holy Spirit that wants to intercede and pray for us with groanings that are too deep for words. Some of us need to admit, Dad, Dad, I don't know what to pray. Dad, I don't know how to pray right now. Dad, this is, this is what I'm dealing with. Dad, you talk to me. Holy Spirit, you talk for me. first dimension as I look back to the cross the second dimension is I look upward into my father's loving face the third dimension is I look inward to Jesus who's living inside of me second Corinthians 13 5 says examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith test yourselves what's the test how do you know if you're a Christian or not Paul's actually describing it right here he says do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. If you believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and you've accepted him into your life to say, okay, Jesus, you're my Lord, then where is Jesus? Inside of you. So the third dimension is I look inward to Jesus living inside of me. Again, Rick Warren says, here's how you spell intimacy. Into me see. Intimacy. Into me see. Jesus is inside of you. Jesus sees the intimate parts of you. Yes, Jesus sees your wickedness, if you want to use that word. He sees your sin. He sees your imperfection. He sees you when you're ticked off. He sees you when you're impatient and unkind. He sees when you're tempted and give in to it because Jesus is inside of you. Again, that might be one of the things that ought to help motivate us. When you go someplace you know Jesus doesn't want to go, 
let it, let it touch you. Jesus says, I don't really want to be here. And you say, oh well, I'm going to do it anyways. Let it, let it affect you. That wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, Jesus is inside of you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to holler at that person driving down the street. And Jesus is inside of you having to deal with what you're saying. Let the reality of the fact, this third dimension, that not only did Jesus die on the cross, but Jesus is right there with you, right there inside of you. The fourth dimension, I look around and I ask the Holy Spirit to use me. See, the Holy Spirit, can, can you see the Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit here today? I sure hope so. <laughs> We're in trouble if the Spirit's not. <laughs> Holy Spirit is with us, next side us, around us, surrounding us, doing things, accomplishing purposes, guiding us, trying to point us to things, setting up divine appointments, all kinds of things Holy Spirit's doing. Listen to Romans 6, 13. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. Or here, I took it in a different version. Uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't write down what it was. It says, give yourself completely to God. Every part of you. Since you've been given a new life and you want to be used, you want to be used as a tool in the hands of God, used for His good purposes. So what I would encourage you to do in order to pray in the fourth dimension is pray, God, use me. God, use me. Use me the way you want to use me, not the way I want to be used. Can you, can you imagine a hammer saying, um, uh, don't use me that way? Or a screwdriver or, 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 or uh, whatever other kind of tool you're using. You know. or, or the car saying, nope, not driving this way today, so I'm just going to shut off. I'll show you, right? And yet, that's, isn't that sometimes what we do with God? We, we're going to tell God how He's supposed to use us. And He's saying, okay, I thought you, I was God, but I guess you're on the seat of control again. And, and God's inviting us to say, no, to, to come to Him. We need to be asking God, God, how do you want to use me? And do you do that as you go through your week? Or is that what you do at the end of the week? Okay, God, I sure hope you used me somewhere along this last week. I've been really busy, had a lot of things on my agenda, and I really was too busy to do anything for you, but I sure hope you used me in spite of that. It, wouldn't it be more beneficial, maybe more wise, maybe even more rewarding for us to start the week saying, God, how do you want to use me this week? Show me each day today, God, how you want to use me. Pray that prayer. But, and why is it that some of us don't pray that? God, use me, because God might do it. Well, but, you know, uh, maybe I don't want to be used the way God wants to use me. And so fear, so this unwillingness to submit. So, and frankly, the temptation to miss out on a God appointment it keeps us from praying, God, use me. Because what happens if He does? What happens if He actually puts me in a place where I'm supposed to put my hand on somebody and pray for them? What happens if I'm the person who's actually supposed to point somebody to Jesus even maybe before they die? Because you never know what's going to happen to the people around you. God, use me. Mother Teresa said, stop trying to do something great. Stop trying to do something great with your life. Just do normal things with a great amount of love and God will bless that. Fourth dimension looks for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you guide me. You work in my life. You use me. And then the fifth dimension is I look forward to my future in faith. So where did we start? We looked back at the cross, right? We looked inside at Jesus. We look around for the Holy Spirit. And, and, and here as we come to the fifth dimension, I look forward to my future in faith. Who knows and is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is. Philippians says it this way, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
is God interested in your dreams? In your hopes, in your plans, in, in what you want to do for the... Yes, God's interested in that. And, and God's actually looking at how to guide you into your future. And ultimately, where does He want you to get? To heaven. <laughs> Meeting Him there at the throne room. He's looking ahead. And so that might be a little bit why He might talk to you about your behavior. <laughs> As you're getting ready to go there, you know, okay, well, I need to kind of help refine you, clean you up a little bit, <laughs> help do some transition here so that you can get ready for heaven. There's a reason why we put communion at the end of today's service. Because in communion, I think you're going to see all five of these dimensions of God. Pause and think about that. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, really a powerful passage for each of us personally. And I would encourage you, as you say, Daddy, Daddy, use me. Daddy, speak to me. That you would pray this. Dad, search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now what I can tell you about communion is number one, no one loves you like God the Father. No one loves you so much that when you were opposed to Him, rejecting Him, hostile towards Him, he died on a cross for you. No one loves you like God the Father. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you as you are. He loves you with great hopes and dreams for you. No one loves you like Dad. No one. Not even Mom. Number two, we belong to each other in God's family. What is it and why do we come up here to the table today? Because coming to the table, the body of Christ is that we are all part of that body, aren't we? We're, we're one in Jesus Christ. We're, uni we're united here at the table. Is any one of us any better than anyone else at the table or at the cross? No. Every single one of us is a sinner. Whatever word you want to use for it, an imperfect person, fallen, right? Messed up, screwed up, all kinds of other words you want to use for it. We're, we've blown it. We've told God off. We've sinned just this week. And what's really bad about that is we're Christians and we've still sinned. But at the table, at the table, we're all one. No one better. And frankly, no one worse. All saved by the grace of God. So we come to the table and we belong to each other in God's family. The third thing is the, the Spirit of Jesus lives inside of us. The Spirit of Jesus Christ is right here inside of us. And so when we come to this table, we're remembering that Jesus, who died on that cross and rose from the dead, is living inside of us. That the Spirit of Jesus is right here with us at all times. We're never alone without Him. Fourthly, this life is not the end of the story. Uh, you, you know, you can try to pile up all kinds of wealth, do all kinds of things, and, and some of us are fighting dying, right? <laughs> I mean, how many of you want to die right now? Right now. Okay, Kate, so would you just kill her quick and say she gets it over with? <laughs> oh, that might put you in jail, but oh well. <laughs> she wants to die right now. <laughs> and Leslie wanted to go with you, so um, maybe you guys can, can just do it. To, yeah, there you go. <laughs> See, the, the fact is, is that there is a human desire to stay alive. The younger you are, the more you want to stay alive, right? <laughs> the older you are, you might be like, you know, okay, the body's wearing out. If we can't get a new one here, maybe I'm ready to get the new one there, right? And yet, even as we age, there's still this desire to, to stay alive. But here's what God's saying to us is that I've got life even better than this for you. I want you to have abundant life here right now because I'm with you, but I've got something even better planned for you, and that's in heaven. And when we come to the communion table, we're remembering that Jesus has something for us in the future.
something very special. And then lastly, we understand, and, and, and Paul said we're supposed to look at this as we examine ourselves and, and look at the, our behavior as we're coming to communion. And if we've got a relationship issue with somebody, we've got to work it out. And he says, some of you are sick because you're eating like a pig at... Well, he doesn't quite use that word, but anyways, you, you kind of have a glutton when you're coming to the table, and so you're missing it. That's not, you've lost the importance of it. And he says, and we're supposed to do this, and as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do this, what? Until Christ comes back. So this is a reminder of something in the future, isn't it? Of the return of Jesus Christ. And so communion has much meaning for us. No one loves you like your father. We all belong to one another in God's family. The spirit of Jesus is living inside of you. What you have happening here, your life here is not the last part of the story. And ultimately, we come to the table because Christ one day is coming again. And we want the people we know to be ready for his return. When are you most likely to forget that Father God loves you? Think about this. What sins or habitual things do you do when you forget how much Father loves you? We're part of a body. Do you know somebody in the body that's in need? What does God want you to do? What happens when you forget that Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Jesus, is living inside of you? And lastly, are you using your time? Are you using even your wealth? as if Christ was all that mattered in your life? Are you investing anything in the life that is to come? And what would change if someone kept reminding you, if you kept reminding yourself, how long is this going to last? How long do you have? No one knows but God and what is God wanting you to do with whatever you have left of your life let's prepare to come to the table let's pray Jesus search our hearts you know us show if there's show us if there's any wicked way, any sinful way in us and cleanse us. Lord, we've been talking about the fact that you are multidimensional. And if all we do is talk about that in a factual kind of way we miss the whole point God there is so much more to you than we comprehend dad dad thank you for loving us for loving us so much that the son part of you died on the cross. For loving us so much that the spirit part of you stays with us even when we sin. For loving us so much that you're there for us all the time even when we ignore you. Dad, 
do something supernatural in us as we come to the table. And help us to prepare for your return. If you just right there where you're at, just pray and prepare yourself for communion. I'm going to ask the worship team to come to the table and I'll pray over the bread and the cup and, and so they can have their communion. But in the meantime, would you just pray about your relationship with Dad? <laughs>